Hi, Uzma. Hi, Samantha. We're here for our part three of our Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers book club. And we were having a little bit of trouble going live on Facebook, but we are going to record this and post it later. So nobody will miss anything. Um, I actually wanted to begin by saying we're on part three. So we finished part one and part two. I will post those links below to the part one recording and the part two recording of our Facebook Lives. And this book, Hold On To Your Kids, Why Parents Need To Matter More Than Peers, is written by uh, Gordon Newfield and Dr. Gabor Matei. And Dr. Newfield is a Canadian clinical psychologist, author, and speaker known for his work in the field of child development and attachment theory. He's the expert here. <laughs> He's written extensively about the importance of healthy attachment relationships between children and their caregivers and how these relationships impact a child's emotional and social development. His work has influenced parenting approaches and educational practices to promote children's well-being and growth. And Uzma, do you want to talk about Dr. Matei? Yes, Dr. Matei is a Canadian physician, author, and speaker who is known for his work in the areas of addiction, stress, and childhood development. He has written several books that explore the impacts of early experiences, trauma, and emotional patterns on health and well being. His work often focuses on the connection between mind, body, and emotions, and he has contributed to discussions on addiction, mental health, and holistic approaches to healing. Awesome. So our book club hosts today are Samantha, who's with us for a little while. Samantha Mo is the author and founder of the Mad to Glad Blueprint, which is a curriculum that illuminates what's been going on beneath challenging behavior in children's brains and nervous systems. It's also a curriculum that teaches parents, educators, and clinicians how to get kids to listen and teaches them how to de-escalate and even prevent what triggers children. So there's more peace, more calm, and more harmony. She's a parent coach and speaker who's a leading expert on brain science beneath challenging behavior based on the Magic Lad blueprint. And she's really great at figuring out what parents unintentionally may do that triggers behavior and how, how we as parents can avoid fueling the fire. So we have Samantha here. And we also have Uzma and Nikki um, in previous book clubs. We've also had Mark. All three of us are um, part of the associates in Samantha Mo and Associates. We are mentors. And we're also, all three of us are educators in different capacities. Um, and all four of us who are your hosts are parents and our children range from age three up to I think 23. All right, Uzma, what are we talking about today in part three? We're talking about how children are stuck in immaturity and how peer orientation stunts the healthy development in this part of, uh, of the book. So one thing I just want to say is, um, you know, there are, this is the media's part, as, as Nikki was saying. Mm -hmm. And so there were times when I was reading these chapters, um, that I really had to put the book down too, <laughs> you know, and I, I did hear most of it on audible, but when I got to the book rereading, it was just very heavy and sad. Yeah. I think we're going to have to do a, a trigger warning for this particular part of the book. Um, because it does talk about bullies. It talks about emotions. It talks about power. It talks about sex, sexualization of children and, Although it was fascinating, I agree, it was difficult to get through and I had to put it down frequently. Like I get through a little bit, I'm like, okay, enough. I, I just can't even, I can't even anymore. <laughs> so I listened to all of it on Audible, but I also, like Uzma, went back to the book to kind of find the highlights of what we'd be discussing today. But to me, this material was hard. I felt like sometimes I question, am I a parent reading this or am I an or am I an educator reading this? And as an educator, I felt a tremendous responsibility because there's the ghosts of children past and there's the ones that are you know, coming up in the future. And I feel like there was a, a sense of burden or responsibility. And there were many parts in this, many parts in the section that we were reading for, for this part three that said what we're doing in education isn't working. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, 
but I agree with you, Uzma. It kind of left a very heavy, kind of sad right. or down feeling. And, and I think- talk about the a trigger warning right yeah yeah and there's like there's mention of suicide so i think all those things it's important for us to say that the good thing is if you are behind on reading or if you're not really you know um wanting to read every single page our facebook live group kind of gives you a good summary so you don't really have to um and you can go back on parse you know at, at your own pace because we're obviously reading it rapidly as well so I think uh, there are some terms. I want to get to that. Let's get started kind of talking about the meat of these chapters. Um, you know, there's- Can we talk about those key um, points? Mm -hmm. Because there's some definitions that I think are really important, especially if somebody's joining us for the first time. And I'd actually recommend that you maybe press pause and listen to part one and part two before joining us for part three, because it is pretty heavy. Um, but the three main points that we talk about is- uh, We'll just kind of talk about definitions one being attachment which is where there's a natural attachment to a parent or a caregiver that's born from dependence and survival it's a primitive instinct and one of the quotes that we kind of paraphrased in part two was the secret of a parent's power is in the dependence of the child okay. um, another definition that's important is the concept of vulnerability which talks about you know being able to not just have feelings, but to feel them <laughs> was a big part of this section. And also maturation, which is my, I think you brought this up when we were talking before the call. Do you want to talk about that? Paradox. Maturation. Right. Mm -hmm. So in order to get mature, you have to be dependent, which seems um, completely counterintuitive to how sometimes we have parented and how we have discussed it in the education world. So it's about, um, building dependence with your child so, and that attachment then gets you know uh, comes through so that these two foster independence and a genuine separation into adulthood yeah. so um that's an important review because these are really the three main things that these four chapters talk about yeah so we are working from um, this version of the book. There is a previous version that has a different cover. And of course, there's the audible version, which you can listen to. So when we mention, if we mention page numbers, it's it's from this text, but it is in section three. So you'll be able to find it. Um, there was a fantastic quote on page 116. Liz, would you want to talk about that one? I, I really love that one. Yeah. It says, attachment is the womb of maturation just as the biological womb gives birth to a separate being in the physical sense, attachment gives birth to a separate being in the psychological sense. Yeah. And, you know, it's really important to recognize that at this part in the book, we're really, I think, kind of evolving into the teenage years, <laughs> especially around age 13, that was mentioned. Um, so as children become teens, we know as parents that it's their job to try out being independent, right? And one of the quotes from the book is, becoming a separate being takes an entire childhood. So kind of feel like there's hope, you know, if our kids are not 26 and actually their brains become an adult, we still have hope and we can kind of, you know, affect the trajectory of their, their lives and their interactions with others. So kind of hoping. That. Nikki, I find that like parallel, you know, to what we always talk about the, the child development really, it's not just when they hit 18, it, you know, they're mature. So it goes right along with that, that it can go into the late twenties now. Yeah. And we know that with research too. So there's hope. And I yeah. think it kind of foreshadows um, the rest of this book it and um, yeah, makes me kind of not throw it away, not put it down, but just to go back. So let's, let's dive more into, you know, some of the stuff that made it kind of difficult to listen and read. Okay. So you guys might've noticed if you're looking at the video that I keep wiping my eye, it's sunscreen, but that kind of reminds me of an important point in the book where I was like that is very interesting especially as an educator who does deal with bullies and those who are bullied um, so one of the quotes from page 123 was one of the most obvious signs of futility sinking in is the eye watering that's set off by feelings of futility or giving up with a healthy sadness a release and a sense that something has come to an end and this is 
the opposite, that would be a healthy reaction to, you know, futility sinking in, but an unhealthy um, reaction would be kind of the, the opposite, which would be a peer oriented child who's stuck in an immature and unconscious resistance. So when the tears stop, it's kind of identifying that the brain's capacity to process emotions has become rigid. And that is frightening to me, but that's what this book is talking about because it's written by psychologists, right? So it talks about the fact that at that point, when emotions become rigid, maturation is impossible. So if maturation is impossible, then these kids are stuck in being a kid, you know, their only influences are other kids and there's no adult to kind of bring them up and, and help them to kind of grow into a mature and, and healthy adult right so this idea yeah. of frustration and futility and you know when something doesn't work what happens and I always think of my own kids right when you say no and they're like but 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 and some parents may give in and other parents kind of like me would be like I understand that you know you're frustrated by such and such but you know this is what we're doing right now or you know in the future, you may be able to have that thing or do that thing. But right now, this is what our family is. is What's doing interesting too, is like a peer oriented child, you know, they can't cry, they can't be vulnerable. And um, it's like a, a coat of armor, kind of, they have to put the shield up. So even if they are feeling these emotions, in order to fit in with the cliques and the groups, they can't shed tears. And so that's almost like a telltale sign too, for parents, if and your teachers. child, like, and teachers, educators, if you notice that they're not crying and there's a reason to cry, right. And that's a, almost like a telltale sign that there's a lot of peer oriented, um, you know, challenges going on. And even like the, this next part, after talking about the tears, there's a discussion about how frustration is a primitive emotion that we feel when something doesn't work. So, and it's the fuel of aggression. And so deal. <laughs> it can lead to unhealthy outcomes, decreasing the likelihood of finding peaceful alternatives, and then kind of leaving them to figure out and adapt. So this is where, you know, chapter 10 kind of started talking about aggression in peer oriented youth. I think in that chapter, when they were talking about peer orientation and <clears throat> the fact that aggression kind of seeps in is that what's happening is that these kids who are peer oriented, they're going along for the ride, right? They're doing whatever the group wants. They're wearing the same clothes, listening to the same music, liking the same things that identities kind of stripped from them. Um, but most importantly, the book talks about the fact that they're less likely to be, to feel apprehension or caution, especially in the face of danger, because Something happens when they're peer oriented and they literally lose their feeling of fear, which is why I think we hear about these horrible events of, you know, child bullying, going to the nth degree type thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they talk about the fact that one third of adolescents statistically no longer have brain activity in the area where alarm is supposed to register. So they end up following peers into dangerous or damaging situations and all of this like the whole thing underlying all of this you know aggression thing is frustration as an emotion that's not being able to be expressed <laughs> I found the author's like parallel and discussion with the book lord of the flies i mean i read that book way back in high school but it left a big impression because i was a teen back then and they talk about and it makes perfect sense like that book makes perfect sense now in this research-based book that we're reading is that that is why there's just a herd mentality that you're just going to follow and even if you have your own thoughts to belong to that group in a peer um centered group you don't want to express dissension and that's kind of where it you know really kind of reminds me of what happens to kids who don't belong in the group you know and that's where I think it's that bullying behavior that starts emerging right and in Lord of the Flies there was um they were good kids they're good schoolboys. you know they were deserted on this island and then they had to survive and 
I think the the essence of the story is when fear started to intensify, then this nice <laughs> being part of this nice society and all of that just kind of fell away and things got fla- fractured and, you know, it kind of, things became violent and there were like pigs heads and chaos. It was just, it was a lot. <laughs> I remember reading that book and it was yeah. pretty exciting at the time because I'm like, how did this happen? Oh my gosh. It was like my first horror really. <laughs> well, but I mean, as a teen reading it, it was kind of like, cool, look at this group and oh my God, that's insane. Yeah. And kind of, I felt a little bit of affinity just being the same age group, but now reading it as an adult, as a parent, as an educator, it's, it's, fascinating to me that this is the comparison that's being made with bullying and right. how it emerges right because you're not being able to um be vulnerable right and express the truths um there was a quote in the book uh, hold on to your kids that i wanted to share and it kind of reminded me of um green light parenting where there's more permissive behavior um, parents don't really hold authority. So it said, uh, if parents are too needy or too passive or too uncertain to assert their dominance, the attachment instincts are going to move the child into that dominance position by default. Such children can become bossy and controlling. Wow. To their parents Mm -hmm. and also to other children as a result. So the attachment becomes inverted in essence. Wow. Yeah. So parents can actually create bullies. Yeah. And they can bully their parents. (laughs) That's wild. Yeah. Oh my goodness. No, no pressure on parenting. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That reminds me um, earlier in the book, there was a, a, and I don't have the quote and I'm kind of paraphrasing my memory of it. There was a part where they talked about kids who just don't have parents who are responsive. Mm -hmm. And there's a a futility that happens during that time with that child. And they, they grieve the loss of the attachment of a parental figure and they seek other parental figures to kind of fill the void because they've grieved the fact that their parents can't give them what they need. Mm -hmm. And those children who are able to grieve that they're able to almost transcend it and become capable, competent humans, despite who they were given as, as parents or caregivers. But it, it was an intentional grieving process. It was an intentional seeking out of adults and role models. And just, you know, it, it changes their whole brain. And I think that it really speaks to children who are able to be resilient in the face of challenges, because that is a healthy emotional reaction to frustration or futility, right? Is I give up, I can't do this, I can't do it on my own, but I'm gonna try again tomorrow or try something different or find someone who can help me. So that I think is really interesting when we talk about bullying and the fact that this parental hierarchy can be inverted. Like Mm -hmm. that's just wild to me. Right. So I think as an educator, we sometimes see that though. For sure. You know, like the, the child who could be the most polite and respectful in class and they're the leader and they do all the right things. And there may be the teacher's pet, stereotypical teachers don't have pets, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> when you see them interact with their, their parents, you're horrified. Like, who are you? You're not mm-hmm. the same child that I've had all day today. How dare you speak to them like that or whatever, right? Like I, I get those all the time. And the next day, I always have that conversation with that child. Like, what are you doing? (laughs) And I've had cases like I I distinctly recall a really, really sweet child that I had in my classes for a couple of years because I looped and the just perfection, right? Everything was perfect in the classroom and was just always very, very um, good about following rules and procedures and was just academically brilliant. And then I had a chance to see her on the playground, um, extremely bossy to her peers who were her best friends. And I had to kind of intervene um, to almost point it out to her and then also her parent, like, this is what's happening. Because like you said, as a leader, right, there's this um, natural thing to control. And and I think this domination comes forward. So, um, you know, I, I think that just like, 
they're they talk about in the book victims you know uh are made in this in this phenomenon in the school world unless they can hide their fears so walking through the hallways for a child who might be feeling like a victim or being bullied it's like a minefield that's how um you know the book mentioned it and basically it's like just in order to survive you have to hide your emotions wow hey i'd love to ask some questions about this yes please Samantha. yeah cool cool <clears throat> so um the bullying topic isn't one i'm familiar with on the day in and day out the way that you both are as educators um and from the parenting perspective, I can almost hear the parents asking some of the questions like, okay, um, so what are the skills my child needs? Uh, so I'd love to hear each of you speak to that. And then if it's a possibility to bridge, um, because we don't want the fix the kid mentality or just equip the kid, it's, and what is the possibility from the parent's role you know, not just like make the kid develop the skill, but what is the skill the parent has to have in the relationship in order to nurture that skill? So <laughs> do you mind if I go first? <laughs> so this is part of the frustration of this book at this point in time, because I think that's coming later in the book. But as educators, I think we could both probably answer these questions for parents and also for you, Samantha. So for kids, you know, this, um, this idea of hiding and not showing your vulnerability, you know, if there's something that bothers you, don't make it very obvious. If there's something that frustrates you, just kind of play it off. So this idea of being able to put on a hard shell at school or, you know, on the schoolyard is really important because bullies prey on vulnerability and they don't let it go, right? Once they see your crack, they're in it. So that's a skill for kids. But the parenting skill is really interesting. And this book does touch on it um, when they talk about suicide, because they said, um, I'll just go straight to one example. There was um, a statistic, it was mothers of children who committed suicide who came together. And there was this one mother whose daughter was a victim of bullying. And she said that every day her daughter would come home and she would cry and she'd talk about what they did. And the mother was the safe space and allowed her to feel her feelings, talk about what's going on and kind of transcend that moment of upset in the care of her mom. So the fact that she had a safe place and somebody to talk to who was interested and who kept asking, that's the skill for parents. Keep asking, pay attention, make sure that you know what's happening in your child's life. Um, the, the doctor had said, Dr. Mate had said afterwards, she will survive because she has that safe place to, to talk to, to decompress and to be able to start the next day fresh. Uzma, do you want to add anything to that? Your, yeah, you, your role you, as an educator is a little bit different than mine. I'm the, I'm the teacher and she's the admin. <laughs> but I think what you said is so key because um, there's a couple of things I want to add. One is that connection piece, right? If parents can maintain those connections uh, by asking open-ended questions uh, instead of how, uh, how's your day? Fine. <laughs> you know, like if, if you're asking those kinds of closed questions, you're not going to be able to get into the child's head. Oftentimes with teens and as they get older, they're not sharing. And what, that's one of the things parents talk about is I miss the times when they were just chatter bugs, you know, it's so quiet. So sometimes teens in the car ride, if you talk, they have that parallel going on. If they're sitting in the front or in the back, they're not looking at you. And so that's a strategy that parents, if they're continuing their connections with their teens and older kids, just asking about different things. It can be different connections. I think we talked about this at a previous Facebook Live about uh, connecting with children and attachments, how sometimes as they get older, you don't actually you know, have deep conversations, but it's about what they like. So if they're into music or something, if they like a certain show, if they're into some trend, it's important for parents to be aware and kind of uh, talk about it as, as a point of interest. And the other thing I, you know, I, I think I read it, or maybe we just talked about it is hugging your children. There's research about what happens to us 
physically when we have the human touch. And I know this is a hard one if your child is kind of pushing away and trying to establish their identity, but being open to listening to their struggles. Uh, children do talk a lot of times if you keep that connection going. And so I do remember a very painful experience when my daughter was in sixth grade. It was a daily conversation of her feeling bad because she did have a couple of bullies. And then the next part was for me to alert her teacher, are you aware that my, and, and it wasn't obvious bullying. It was very subtle. So it looked like friendships, but there was bullying on the playground. So in a school setting, I think for educators, it's really important to look for those interactions, you know, uh, are they healthy? Is a child sitting by themselves? Are they going to the library? I once praised a child for going to the library and reading, and later I kind of figured out she doesn't have friends. And so these are little little things that not just parents, but educators play a huge role because a lot of this bullying is not happening at home. It's happening in the school setting. So a school really has to have a very and this is the part that's very paradoxical, again, because the book says schools are not good places sometimes to uh, prevent bullying. They call but it a I, bullying factory. It's like yeah, the perfect and that's where, that's where the heaviness came for me, because as an educator and administrator on top of that, I was like, I play a huge role in this, you know, and, and when we do see bullying happen and it, we failed, that's, you know, important to build a sense of community in the school environment. And I think like, Mickey, you have a great example that you can maybe talk about. Sometimes it's not about programs. It's not about what a school can do. It's about a teacher and an interaction with one student. So Nikki, please share that part. It's very moving and it's very hopeful too. For parents. Samantha, I did we answer your question? Uh, you did. I, I, uh... I'm reminded of what you had summarized earlier from the book about how we have the child's entire life because uh, to work on connection. And so I think that the examples were really helpful from the parenting perspective with the parent who already feels connected with their child and they're worrying and wondering like, what do I do? I love the tips of, um, who's my, you're talking about checking, you know, uh, going through that period yourself as a parent being resilient every day for however long that stretch lasted in sixth grade, that was a hard phase for your daughter. Um, Nikki, you're talking about checking in regularly as well, keeping the conversation open, giving them tools and even conversation around having that protection or having your kind of being guarded for those families who are already empathetic and teaching their kids it's okay to have emotions, like also training to the situation um, about not always wearing your heart on your sleeve because then the bully finds that crack. Um, I think that's all super useful. And I'd love to hear your example and maybe we'll riff on this another time. But um, the other thought that comes up for me is what about for the parent who feels like they, of course, care about their child because they see struggle, but they don't feel that connection. The parent who maybe had postpartum depression that wasn't repaired, that there was a disruption. And then you've got years and years of difficulty caring for a child without feeling the oxytocin bond for various reasons. Um, so I'm just going to table that for now, but know that that's where I think we need to I table really that because the book is not yeah. helpful. <laughs> That'll be us riffing yeah. for sure. <laughs> that would that will so so anybody who has that that feeling right now like we can we can have that Facebook live discussion another time so just comment and let us know if if that feels like it it will be relevant thank you for that feedback ladies no problem so as I was reading this and I was um, the word we use is heavy I was feeling heavy I was feeling responsible you know I was thinking about students who you know gone through my classrooms and my schools that I've interacted with in the past and it struck me. I'm like, I remember telling one of my student teachers, my teacher candidates, um, you know, how, how do you, how do you get your class to, to listen to you? Right. How do you get them? How do you do this classroom management thing? Like, what's the trick? And I said, honestly, when I was growing up, my parents had an evil eye. My parents were lovely. They were kind, they were caring, they were everything. But when they gave you that look, you just knew exactly what to do and what not to do. And I think I, I learned the look <laughs> and you know what I, I shared with my 
teacher candidate, it was the first week of school that they were in my classroom. And I said, it's almost like the resting B face, right? Like you're, you're pleasant and you're the, the perfect kindergarten teacher. I teach grade one. So you can imagine, right? I'm bubbly. And then when something happens that is not acceptable, the face drops and it's the resting B face. Do we want to try that again is usually what would come out of my mouth. You know, could you please try that again? Do you want to try that again? Maybe we should re rewind and start again type thing. And then my personality comes back. So they're like, Ooh, I didn't like that. So I feel like that's one of my little teacher tricks that I do. And perhaps as a parent, well, for sure, as a parent, I also do it. But there was one particular child that came to mind and it was kind of like, when this content was kind of sitting on me and I'm like, oh, the, the suicide and the age 13 with the sexualization of children and just all this stuff. And I remember this little guy, we'll call him Nick because I'll remember Nick because that's my name. So Nick was in grade eight. Um, I was teaching uh, grade one at the time. And he, at the worst time, he threatened to jump over the railing from the second floor to the first floor right? So as an educator, that is a suicide threat and we need to engage the authorities. So let's fast forward a little bit till after that, because the stairs were like my classroom door was at the bottom of the stairs. I was very much part of this whole thing and talking him down literally onto the floor um, or back onto the floor and not over the railing. And you could kind of see like he was, was he doing it for attention? Was, what was it? Right? So I felt like I felt a bit connected to him because he did listen to me. And I don't know why he listened to me because I'm just the kin the grade one teacher, kindergarten teacher, right? Um, but afterwards, I, I started talking to him and I, I started inviting him to come into my classroom. So at first it was, oh, can you help me organize this? Oh, can you help me clean up because we're painting today? Oh, can you, you know, come and do whatever? And we started to have more and more conversations. So the bond began. And ultimately, if I fast forward that part of the story, I invited him to come and read to my grade ones anytime he needed a break. It could be at recess, he could come into my classroom, during class, he could come into my classroom, anything. And the understanding between him and me was, if he needed to get away and he came into my room, I would text his teacher to say he was with me. So his attendance would be noted, right? And what I found, um, what we found as a educator team was that the bullying on the playground and the bullying in grade eight started to lessen because he was the ringleader and wow. what he started to say in his taunts instead of things that were really cruel was oh come on like a six-year-old could do better than you or you know a kindergarten kid could figure that out so his taunts were more related to his experiences that he was having in my classroom fast forward a little bit longer um he graduates. Uh, I was able to give him an award during his grade eight graduation on stage. Very, very proud of that because I collected letters that my students had wrote and, and notes from their parents who'd interacted with him. And I put them all into a card and it said, do not open till you get home. And he put that into his jacket pocket and it was like June. It was hot. It was sweltering. He did not take that jacket off. He kept that note next to his heart and he <laughs> he wanted to make sure it didn't get lost because he had a feeling of what was in there. And it was, I'm sure it was very touching. Fast forward, he finds me on social media and he tells me since he graduated from grade eight, he's graduated from high school because he knew that education was important. His mother died of cancer. He ended up living with his aunt who had four children. She's a single mother and he ended up taking on the role of father figure for these kids. And he said, because of the time he spends in my classroom, he's reading to these kids. He's nurturing these kids. He feels like they're his own. And I'm like, whoa, this is like seven, eight years later. And this is the outcome of me just giving him a safe space in my classroom. Right. So I feel like we don't really realize the impact that we have in the little things that we do, even as parents, or especially as parents. And even though the kids may not talk to us, not respond to us, tell us that we're not cool, whatever it is that they're responding with, they are hearing us. And they are experiencing our attempts at connection. So when they really, really need it, you as a parent need to make sure that they know you're a safe place and that they can come to you, right? I mean, I have a 15-year-old daughter and one of our conversations is, if you're ever in trouble, you call. There will be no questions asked. We will come and get you, right? There may be conversation tomorrow, but there'll be no questions asked at that time. I'm sure, Uzma, you've had some similar challenges with your daughters being in their 20s. Yeah. I mean, it, as I was listening to your story, which is such a beautiful outcome, I kind of thought back to what Samantha's question was too, mm -hmm. that what if the parent can't, and I know we're going to table that, but right off what I got out of your 
um, experience with this child is there was somebody else. Yes. It wasn't the parent. There was somebody else who was there. Um, and so that's the whole part for like, if, if a parent's feeling really, really disconnected or, you know, can't reach the child, there might be somebody else. And then it's a matter of figuring out who, and maybe it's not the parent who figures it out. Sometimes it is on the teacher. That's why teachers feel so much stress, especially in the last four years since the pandemic, they feel responsible for the mental well-being of the child, not just the academic piece. Um, and I think that's grown, like that's always been in the back, um, you know, of our minds, but I think it's grown tremendously. So as I listened to your story, I was just thinking like, wow, you made a difference. And sometimes it's an aunt, sometimes it's an uncle, sometimes a little bit younger person who's kind of, you know, with it is accepted by the child. Like my daughter is so connected to a cousin of mine and it's like their aunt and she's 10 years younger than me. So they just love connecting with her. And sometimes it's her over me. So these are a couple of things I pulled out from your story. What a beautiful ending. <laughs> I thought so. And we would never have predicted that. <laughs> you knew it back then. Um, I, I remember seeing something somewhere on social media and it was about hugging your kids, right? And it said, when you hug your kids, hold them for as long as they need you to. Don't let go until they let go because you're kind of like a battery charger and until they're fully recharged, they still need you. And I thought, do I hug my kids enough? I don't know if I do, but I think I need to make an effort. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did when they were little, but as they're older, I think so even true. that, you know, so one again, of my daughters effort. is a hugger and she will say that that was too quick. Yeah. I should have read the same research. <laughs> so she will say that's not a real hug. And so it does depend on kids because my other kid doesn't need that. But my one of my children and I, I think I found even it's a battery charger for me. If you are having a hard time and you just stay in that hug a little bit longer, it does make you feel better, even without I'm any- I'm sure there's goals. science there, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so you're a better- if, if I could, yeah, could I share something too? Yes. So the hope for me in listening to that share, and, and um, it's an amazing story. Thank you, Nikki, for that. And I think giving everybody hope for the educators who lead with love, I think like that's the the moral that I took away from it, even though I heard you two talking about, you know, the burden or the pressure or the the desire to get it right and to do it well and the ghosts of children past and all of that. It's like, so how do we, I get kind of esoteric here because like, so how do we, um, how do we lead if we don't know a bunch of tactics or we're not exactly sure what to do next or how to have the emotional conversations? Like, well, you lead with love. And when you have that posture of love, it guides you, or at least at the very least, which is pretty powerful, it can become a magnet for a child. And earlier in this book, they talked about how in the US, I think they were saying the US, maybe they were talking about other nations as well, um, but they were talking about how we're missing, I don't know if they were saying we we're missing tribe, maybe we talked about that but they were saying the importance of a large group of caring adults that a child is raised. And so in those moments where we might be feeling disconnect, knowing the posture is where totally burnt out, we'll find a Carol or 15 year old boy scouts of America tend to have pretty loving, uh, quirky leaders, you know, like where is there a place of worship? Is there an extended right. family member? So where are the adults that can also lead with love? Fun fact in Ontario, where I live in Canada, um, high school students are required to, to do 40 hours of community service to graduate and what they've found statistically is that most in their first year of high school finish the 40 hours and continue to volunteer 
But the volunteering is not just about giving free service. The volunteering is about relationships with people outside of their home who are adults and who are in a mentoring capacity, right? So the volunteering might be something that they enjoy doing. The volunteering might be something to do with their future career. Whatever it is, it's their choice. And that is part of the tribe. That is part of the, it takes a community to raise a child. So I have always found that fascinating because my daughter just finished her first year of high school and she's like, oh, I've got to, you know, volunteer for the city and we've got to do this event and we've got to, and I'm like, just relax, it'll come. <laughs> You'll find your people, you know? So it definitely does take a whole community. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the time. It's been such a great discussion. Uh, initially we were thinking, gosh, it's, you know, such a rich, deep topic. How are we going <laughs> to condense it? But I think Maybe we want to wrap up and give some hope to uh, of what's coming in part four, unless either one of you have anything else to add. <laughs> um, that last chapter <laughs> or the last two chapters, chapter 12. Yeah. Are we going to skip it? Well, I think like it's or just we talk about attachment. I think it's just really kind of a lot parcel of that attachment. I do want to end on a higher note okay. <laughs> and leave our audience. Okay. I will just say it's a trigger warning and it, it really talks about unfulfilled attachment needs. Yes. What happens when children don't feel connected, they will find that connection. And I think the shocking part in just that chapter was that um, just Age. as a status and I don't know, like, I don't know, you would do a better job of, um, you would do a better job of condensing that. But I would just say that children aren't uh, being sexually active necessarily for that sense of intimacy. It's again, that peer orientation. Absolutely. I guess that's the best summary I could come up with. Absolutely. So before we lose all hope and abandon this book, we're saying that there's there's more to come and there's some answers to come in the future chapters. So I am looking forward to continuing with it. So part four is going to be about how to hold on to our kids and how to reclaim them. And I, I just have a feeling that that's going to answer more of what Samantha was getting at. And part five is about preventing peer orientation. And part six was a postscript that was added after this book was originally published. And it includes um, a discussion on the digital age and how that has affected this generation, especially when it comes to maturity and peer orientation. So we look forward to having everybody back on August the 27th, which is a Sunday, same time as today, which is 11 Central, noon Eastern or nine Pacific. So look forward to having you guys again. Thanks, Thank Uzma. You. Thank you, Nikki. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.